from the opera. Susie Lelga Farring, Commissioner. Commissioner Sean McCoy. Ed Rodriguez, Commissioner. I'll start again, Chair. <laughs> Marshall Martin, Commissioner. Jim Waters, Commissioner. Tim Wallace, Assistant Attorney. Eugene May, City Attorney. Sarah Harold Dominguez, Interim Executive Director. Molly O'Donnell, Housing Director. Kendra Daniels, Assistant 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 Kendra we need to approve the February 21st, 2023 minutes. And we should be approved. So moved. Second. That's been moved by Council Water, uh, no, Commissioner Waters. Second by Commissioner Yarbrough. Is there any discussion on minutes? Seeing the minutes vote, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed. It is passed unanimously. We are now public by the concurrence. So I'm going to kick this off for us. Um, just kind of grounding you with where we left off last week. So we're not going to go to first. Uh, we all um, presented to you the options for the community services and how to include those. And the decision that night was to focus on housing, um, get the units that we need. We can figure out the community services in, in an appropriate amount of time. So we gave that direction back to Henrose. I'm going to introduce Shannon here in, in a moment. Um, and we said, let's focus on housing, get the units. So they went back and did that. And as she'll explain, I think in, in other terms, um, the gap was pretty large, too large. The funding gap and so what they did instead was saying let's design to what we can afford and see what that ends up looking like so that's what we're going to show you here tonight um but first i wanted to introduce shannon she's a shannon cox baker she is with penrose and she is our main point of contact as our development partner on this over land which we need to name um and so I think Shannon just is going to introduce herself and then kind of give us some basics on this project and really kind of what we do on a daily, well, weekly basis with Shannon to get this project where it is. Um, and then you have a handout in your packets that is from Penrose and it's kind of a, a summary of this project that we can kind of, um, you can refer to at your leisure and then we'll have up here as well. So, um, so I'm I'm Shannon. I'm a uh, um, uh, new-ish to Penrose. Um, I've been with the organization for just over a year, but I'm not new to Colorado or to Boulder. I've been a Boulder County resident for 20 years and um, have worked in affordable housing for most of that. Um, spent uh, quite a bit of time actually with Boulder Housing Partners, so with the Housing Authority for the City of Boulder, and um, and then. Uh, Penrose, I joined the Penrose team a year ago as their regional vice president, opening up for their western expansion office, and so now I'm over in Colorado, Arizona, and Utah. And super excited when our fee came out for this site. Um, I love doing work in the community where I live, and so I was really um, thrilled that our team was chosen to develop this site in partnership with you guys. So, um, very happy to be here, and um, as Molly said, we we have been we have been really working hard towards um, you know trying to get a concept plan that means a lot of of you know what are very ambitious objectives on a number of levels. You know the right mix of housing that really works with the financing that's available that serves families that really you know pushes the needle on some of the larger units with three and four bedrooms. Um, without sacrificing a sense of place, community, nice outdoor space, you know, a place that people want to be that feels welcoming and friendly if you're, you know, um, a grandma or, you know, a parent with an infant or a teenager, 
you know, trying to create a community that serves the needs of a whole, you know, broad demographic um, is can be a bit of a challenge, but I think the site is in a great location with a lot of cool amenities around it, you know, parks, just walkability, like really kind of being nestled there in between single family neighborhood and the, you know, kind of lighter retail commercial area. Um, it's a great site. It's a great site in a lot of respects. And, um, you know, as Molly mentioned, our, our biggest our biggest challenge has been trying to right size the, the development to what funding is available. And this is a really challenging, you know, financing environment for us to be in right now with interest rates um, at their, you know, peak um, with construction costs. We haven't seen them coming down. In fact, you know, we're still baking in construction cost cushions, uh, you know, in anticipation that costs continue to go up. And so we're not really operating in the most friendly financial environment. So, um, so we try and, my hard job, hardest part about my job is trying to temper that enthusiasm, right, between like, what do we really want to do here and what pragmatically can we do here. And so um, I think the process for landing on a concept is maybe taking a little bit longer than we had hoped and anticipated, but, um, but I'm a big believer in if you do the work and you invest up front, and you iterate and iterate and iterate until you get to a solution that you're you feel like this is it we've exhausted our options and this feels realistic um that time is best invested in the front end and you know regretting something or trying to come back later and, and fix something if you you know maybe shot a little too high or, um you know, can't pull it off so that's that's never the solution or the situation we're going to find ourselves in so um, so I think where we sit today with the, with the concept plan that we have um, is, is near, we're nearly there. I think we're nearly there. There's probably a little bit more dialogue and discussion for us to have about the site and how it's all taking shape and how we accommodate you know, these really fun uh, community serving assets, the library, the early childhood education, you know, how we really knit in the community room. So those pieces are still in development. Um, we still have some work to do and really thinking through that unit mix and the layouts of the units. So, and again, we haven't even touched the exterior of the building elevations. What's it going to look like? You know, that's a little bit further down the road. But um, I would say we're probably 85, 90% of the way there to what we would feel like is like, this is the concept, let's, you know, let's let this one settle and work towards the details. Um, <coughs> So, you all have the numbers in front of you. Um, you know, where we stand right now is, is a, a unit count of 57. Um, and this unit mix is actually still a little bit in flux. Um, this isn't even reflective of our last conversation, which had 15 one bedrooms, more two bedrooms, like 27 two bedrooms, and then 12 threes and, and three fours. Uh, again, just talked with Katie this, this morning, and she was like, yeah, can you get a couple of more, you know, four bedrooms in there? And so just to kind of give you a sense, like, this isn't settled. We're still, we're still kind of refining. On the incomes, you know, we've got a pretty broad income mix. We're really trying to serve the full spectrum from 30% area median income, which would be considered extremely low income, to 80% area median income, which, again, Two years ago, we would call workforce, but you know, even folks on the eighty percent of the are well priced out of, of the market. So, um, so we can leverage tax credits, which is our primary source of equity on these projects, um, and still income restrict at a, a much higher income, which is great because that just means we can serve more people across a, a larger band. Um, again, not set in stone, but but these numbers, the rents of these um, these incomes at these unit mixes you know, uh, would generate, obviously, help us to leverage more debt. So that's that's really the sensitivity analysis we do there on the income mix. It's like, you know, if we need to leverage more debt, then maybe we move to higher income, um, or we leverage project phase vouchers, more of those, those obviously drive higher income. So um, so that's kind of the logic behind the, the unit mix in the, in the incomes. Um, just high level, and, and I want to talk to you more. I want to give you all a chance to ask any questions. Um, we're looking at almost a $30 million development, total development cost for the project. Um, and I, your eyes might go quickly to the, the land price, the $2 million. 
that just so you know is a bit of a placeholder right now that's just like our kind of broad brush stroke assumed appraised value of the land and there would be a commensurate you know use and a source that would match and so that will end up being whatever that final number will, will be based on an appraisal based on income restrictions on the property so um, for all intents and purposes what matters is you'll see Two million for acquisition, and then you'll see another two million for the LHA seller carry. So those two balance each other out. And again, on construction costs, um, these things are all, all kind of you know baked in together. Um, construction costs were around I think it's around three hundred twenty-five, maybe three hundred thirty thousand dollars a door for for construction costs, and that does have a cushion built into it too. Which as we get closer and closer to construction. You know, we hope to see that cushion evaporate and push that money to other things, but you know, it's it, we have to kind of plan for the worst case scenario real early here in the process. Um, and the rest of the costs, the soft costs, you know, the owner contingency, the financing fees, those are really all driven by all of the underwriting requirements for these types of transactions. We're limited on developer fee, that's capped by the Colorado Housing Finance Authority. Um, and then reserves, all these things are sort of based on, you know, metrics and um, underwriting standards that all the tax credit investors and vendors kind of impose on us. So this is very commensurate with what you would see in any kind of tax credit finance affordable housing development. Um, and then the next one down, and we've been, we were having a nice conversation about operating expenses and property management, and this will be, this will be a big focus of our conversation going forward uh, because we want to be really thoughtful and really mindful about what does it truly cost to operate a development <coughs> community that has a lot of larger households or a lot of kids. It's so a lot of wear and tear, we know that, and we so we just have to be realistic and honest about preparing for that and planning for that, thinking about things like replacement costs and you know repairs and maintenance and snow removal and, and all those things. But y'all have a um, nice portfolio with great examples of how your other developments are operating. Penrose obviously has a really um, extensive portfolio, and so you know this team here will do the work to make sure that those numbers are realistic and well thought out and based in our kind of shared experience. Um, so maybe real quick, if you just kind of want to hit on the timeline, so. Um, these deals are like, it's like a marathon, um, you know, you do all this upfront training and then you apply for your tax credits and you get a tax credit award and you're still, you know, two years out from having your first resident live in the building. But um, this, just to kind of give you a sense, it really is, you know, roughly a, a three-year endeavor from the time we apply for tax credits. And the intent is to submit an application August 1st of this year. Chapel will typically award credits in November, and then we would be off to the races to, you know, get a building permit, close on our financing, and start construction in the spring of next year. Oh, <coughs> um, and then uh, we've got about a year and a half for construction, and then lease up will begin, and we give ourselves a nice big window for leasing up a building uh, of this size with, with again with larger households. So. So, best case, um, fall of 2026 is when the, when the building would be open. Um, and then, we'll just kind of hit on the site plan. Do you want to walk through that? I don't know um, everything that's in. Sure. Really work on the site plan. You'll see the area that says phase two, and that was the more traditional multifamily complex we talked about where we were discussing the potential for early childhood library annex. When the gap really started materializing in terms of what we were dealing with, what they talked about was splitting this into two phases. And so based on council or the commissioner's conversation in terms of trying everything we can do to figure out how to incorporate the, the other amenities into it, this actually buys us time to look at other strategies to include those things like early childhood and or library annex or some other component because we're not pressed to try to get it in with the rest of the deal. And I think that was something we all had to really wrap our hands around as we were going through it. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that's a that's a great example. I and mean, it could be it could take shape in a lot of different ways. Um, I think that's the intent. That the the library and the ECE, I think, are this would be an amazing site to have either or both of those, just because of all the rooftops you have in this part of town, and just the proximity to family, you know, apartments, and that would be amazing to have that, you know, right outside your door. So. Um, we'll continue to, I think, have a conversation and hope that that would be a good fit here. Um, but again, it could morph into something else. It could be more housing in the future. It could be any number of things. Just to highlight uh, Shannon's term of right sizing the project, that's really how we got here. We said maximize units. Oh, wait, that gap is too large to fill. Let's right size it, and that left this as an opportunity for the future. So, either way, this is really what is feasible to build, even if we are maximizing units now. Yeah. Can we gap this? I think we're at like 2.2 to 2.5. Yeah. So if you remember, we're at 4 million, right size of 3 million, splitting it up, and we think we can manage through a 2 million gap with all of the resources and money that we have. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit of magic. Sprinkle in there. Um, you know, I um, just to point it out. So, so it really is more of like a L-shaped building, which I think is nice from a. I'm not an architect, so um, I won't. I won't try and play one tonight. But this is just it creates a nice street presence, right? Like it's just like to have front stoops and front doors, and like kind of would feel like a little front lawn. Um, as you're kind of coming around the property here with the parking lot being accessed from the Walgreens is sitting over here so it kind of feels like sort of the back of the site whereas this feels more sort of friendly and, and um, matching in terms of like residential here and residential here facing each other and you know we're still working through exactly where this play area and the standalone community room could go but this creates a nice little connection here, this sort of street crossing on Cook uh, that goes, and there's actually, it's off the page here, but there's like a pavilion, I think, a little bit here. In between Hearthstone and Lodge. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we're even still looking at, like, can we break the building up here and maybe bring this connection back through and then have that play area, that community room, feel a little bit more central to the site. So um, still, still working through that, but I think the, the Lego pieces are here uh, in a way that we're also pretty good about in terms of these are all one-story units, even the three and four bedrooms, so no interior stairs, uh, which I think probably really is amenable to multi-generational households where you might have folks who really, everybody wants to live on the ground floor. So we're, we're, that's the concept we have here, and maybe if you go to the Next one. This is a bit more of a, you know, uh, 3D rendering. It's a three-story walk-up. So this isn't an elevator, interior corridor building. Uh, again, like all those front doors and back doors are kind of accessible from either a stairwell or, or at grade, uh, which again just kind of feels a little bit more suitable for the surrounding context and the other single-family homes and the multi-family that's over here as well. Um, and then. I threw in, and then I apologize, I didn't put up like a description here, but this is a really great real life example of what this building could look and feel like. And so Del Corazon is in Denver. Um, Van Eater Williams College, who's the project architect, also designed this community. And it's similar in a lot, a lot of ways in that it's, you know, three stories. Um, this is the community room that's, you know, kind of off to the off to the <coughs> side here, but different material to kind of differentiate it from the residential units. Um, but you've got, you know, access into the stair cores here from the outside, which again, something we had talked about, maybe we close the stairs so they are more secure or private. Uh, but, you know, whether we end up doing balconies or, you know, front porches, again, all that stuff still remains to be uh, thought through. But um, nice kind of community presence, and this would be sort of along the lines of we would envision it look like. Is there a house in the floor building as well? No, that's a private developer. So to add on to that, what we were trying to do was have, you know, there's a piece when you're building three and four bedroom apartment units, rental units. Four bedrooms are pretty rare. Um, we do have a need in Longmont for them. Um, 
but really when you're trying to market that, a traditional apartment building might not be what a family that's looking for a four bedroom home is gonna be looking for. So having those front doors for, to the street, it looks like multiple buildings, even though um, it's technically not, and that's really to make the construction more feasible cost-wise. Um, I just feel like it's a, a cool way to, it's win-win, feels like, to, for certain reasons. It's very appealing. Mm -hmm. So, is that the end of the <clears throat> How do you manage ADA compliance in a three-story building without problems? You put your ADA units on the ground floor, and you just have to make sure that's dispersed amongst one, two, three, and four bedroom unit types. So, there, obviously, there's a limited number of ADA people who need ADA compliance. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, on the on the, the first take, well, first of all, just on this study, just so I understand what I'm seeing, um, there, was, we, there was a study conducted. Is the conclusion, the conclusion is it concluded the following. Of the total 98,000 people and number of housing units along the way, it was to be concluded that 2,800 of them were occupied by large family households, five or more. Is that what this means? And that of those 2,800 households, 23% is that the way to interpret this? Yes. So this is a sneak peek of the data that's coming from our housing needs assessment. Right. And that's what it's finding. So then, I just want to make sure that it's understood. Mm -hmm. um, if I look at the, <clears throat> if I look at the gross rents, help me understand the relationship between uh, uh, AMI, number of units, and gross rent. Yeah. Because um, it's like, it's all over the place. I mean, what would I mean? And we can you can obviously provide this. We have all, all kinds of data, so we can show um, we have an AMI table that shows what the area median income is at each of those 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percentiles based on household size, right? So it's a function of how many people live in the house plus where your income is, and then the gross rents are tied to 30 percent of that household income. So that's the maximum amount of rent that could be then charged. To so, so somebody making sixty percent of AMI, mm -hmm. the maximum they would pay is less than somebody making thirty percent of AMI. So the thirty good catch. So the thirty percent AMI units have the project-based voucher rent on them, and they are actually in excess of. So that's the four subsidies. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I, I get there's there's a subsidy, but there's a subsidy for the for each of these. I mean, everybody the 30s and the 50s, yeah. They have PVDs, project-based vouchers on the 30s and the 50s. Not on the but 60s kind of, or the 80s? Not on the 60s or the 80s, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you generally so, wouldn't, wouldn't want to, you know, um, utilize what is a really precious resource, a, a project-based voucher on a 60 or 80 percent AMI unit. They, you tend to see housing authorities in, in any jurisdiction that uh, awards those they tend to just stay in the thirty percent units, but y'all have a lot more latitude to form on the fifties too. All right. And then can I add to that, Shannon? To, yeah, of course. You um, maybe something that's helpful too is that the LIHTC rents are meant to be affordable in and of themselves. So when Shannon's saying the sixties and the seventies aren't subsidized, the the project based vouchers make units affordable to extremely low income households, uh, but like traditionally in all of our other properties without project-based vouchers, due to the LIHTC um, program and the maximum rents, those LIHTC rents that are listed on there are meant to be affordable in and of themselves without additional subsidy like the 30s and 50s have. So I don't know if that makes sense. It's the calculation is tied to what they are, their affordability level is. So, I would say the other value is that with the project-based voucher rent, then you, you have more net operating income, right? So you can leverage more debt. So if we if we had no project-based vouchers and we charge the true 30 and 50% of your rents, that would reduce reduce our you know ability to service more debt, which means we end up with a bigger gap or yeah. less units. So this kind of helps us cross that bridge. I'm going to assume the, uh, the LHA seller carry is an LHA donation to 
this project at two million dollars? Um, so because that's the land we own, right? Yeah, right. So we're donating the land, and, so, and you're estimating what the how it will be uh, uh, appraised, right? At two million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and so the you're going to apply for tax credits in August, um, and you'll hear you'll how it be till when? November. Usually. So you'll know by November 23. Yes. Uh, whether or not will this be a nine percent application? Four percent in state credits. So the state the state credit application is technically the one that's due on August first, but states get period four. So. So, so it'll be four percent, which is not competitive. It's not competitive. Is this, right? this is because it's a state. It's four percent state credit, which is competitive, and then you have four percent non-competitive. So this is the four percent competitive. Yeah. Yes. Um, and it's help me understand conversion 2026 in October. You're going to be leasing up from mid from mid winter to late spring, mm -hmm. uh, or you know, mid spring. And in conversion October 26, help me understand terminology of conversion in the in the lifetime. So to convert out of the construction loan and into the so that's a conversion loan. from the construction yeah. loan. The mortgage. Yep, and so we have to show three months yeah, to stabilize. That's, that's right. Thank you. Welcome. Good questions. Commissioner uh, Thank you. Um, so, my question is that since this is kind of a newer product that's going to be rolled into the portfolio, uh, do we see a big difference in, say, average length of tenancy in larger units versus? Traditionally, small units. Also, the difference between age restricted and non age restricted. For um, occupancy, I think there's such a need that these households aren't going to be able to find, and that's what we see at um, AMN already. That the larger units don't have a high turnover rate because they can't just go find something else either. Sure, and so when I saw in financials, it had five percent vacancy rate. Is that probably just being a little conservative? Mm -hmm. That's just a baseline underwriting standard. Yep. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yep. Thank you. We've had an active wait list for that four bedroom, the two well, four I bedrooms at AMN for a very long time. Yeah, I just figured that let's say, you know, it's multiple children household, somebody's likely to be in there a bit longer, mm -hmm. per se. That's why I asked about average length of tenancy or occupants. So what happens, well I know what happens, but this is based upon their income at that level. But if they're in there for a while and their income goes up, how do you handle that? Do they have to leave? No. Not with tax credits. So okay. basically once you qualify with tax credits, you're always eligible. Um, you can go, you're allowed the first year up to 140% AMI at your first year of recertification. Um, so it's basically a program that makes, wants you to increase your income and stabilize your household. Okay. And there's no real penalty unless you've lied on your initial application. So, so in, in a project-based voucher, so let's say we have a project-based voucher and they start out at 30% AMI, and they come in and they research, and all of a sudden they make more money, then what that does is it reduces the amount of money that the voucher coming in and increases the amount of money they pay, which that money then goes back into the voucher pool, correct? Mm -hmm. The aggregate, so then as, as people are moving up, that actually creates financial capacity to release to, another, to release voucher. another voucher. Okay, that makes sense. All right. So you don't need direction on this. This is a presentation. This is following up on what we said. We wanted you to meet Shannon, see who the partner is, or see one of the partners, or any of them on the Shannon side. And then we're going to keep moving forward. We wanted to explain phase one, phase two, to the point of keeping the other pieces in play as long as possible. Um, and if there's not any um, additional questions or direction on this, we're moving into. Okay. The pin was the developer? Yes. yes. So that's the bit of the deadline you said is in August 1st. August. And obviously, on top of this, we're trying to get a different meaning with LBC and Platte River in terms of figuring out the sustainability pieces. And 
that's separate, again, having the manage the financial gap and all of this. Yeah. yeah, there's some really exciting funding sources that are coming online, too. I mean, you all are probably familiar with um, even the federal appropriations um, requests. I mean, those deadlines are happening right now this week. Um, those, you know, uh, typically tend to go towards projects that are more shovel-ready, so that might be a source that you look at for next year, especially as we're thinking, like, in anticipation of a future gap, or maybe it becomes a good use of funds for um, the ECP or the library. Um, there's new 45L solar tax credits, which is something that we'll be talking about too, and how we leverage that and bring more equity into the deal to help finance the, the actual installation of solar panels, which is usually something we all want to do and, and don't often have the opportunity to put into projects like this. So. Um, so yeah, so it's um it's a it's a really exciting um, opportunity and um, really want to thank you all for inviting me to your meetings. It's great to meet you. You just you lay it out quite well. Mm -hmm. Good. So, well, and I I know you have a full agenda and you've already been here for several hours, but if, if you have any questions about Penrose, I'd be happy to answer those too. Yeah. Great. So let's move on to our first resolution, 2023. Thank you. Yeah, you did. This is just accepting the vouchers, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so can we have a motion to move resolution? So moved. Second. Okay, Commissioner uh, Martin moved 2023 08, seconded by Commissioner Waters. Those in favor, please say that. Aye. Opposed? So that passes unanimously. On the next one, 2023 approval of acceptance of the ARPA grant funds for Zinni Prince for the Alpha. Does 2023 on has been moved by Commissioner Waters, seconded by Commissioner Yarbrough? Um, if there's no discussion, let's know. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously as well. Resolution 2023-10 is approval of acceptance of all the grant funds for 1764 and 1780 Homer Street development. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little intro on this one. Well, not intro, you've heard about it since yes. the city council did this, but um, on March 22nd is our next LHDC board meeting. And at that meeting, we're going to propose their approval of the purchase price um, for this Homer land. So they, LHDC purchased that land using city affordable housing funds in 2014 um, for 800,000. And we have granted, the city has granted the ARPA funds to LHA for 800,000 for the intent to purchase that land with it. So next Wednesday, we're proposing to the LHDC that they approve that sale. And then we'll grant up, uh, draft up closing documents and such, but just so you're aware, we we're proposing to the LHDC to purchase it for the same price that they purchased it for. Basically just make it an asset Switch. transfer. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Thanks for that, that, mm -hmm. that made sense. I was kind of wondering what this was about. Mm -hmm. So, um, can I have a motion to approve this resolution? Yes. 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 Commissioner Vidal Ferry, second by Commissioner Martin. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? So that passes unanimously. Uh, resolution 2023 11. We need to accept the promissory note for building in place, redevelopment costs being One statement. This is just a loan from LHDC to be able to pay those invoices as they come in and we'll repay that. Okay, great. Are there any questions about that? So can I have a motion to move 23 So moved. Second. All right, that's been moved by Commissioner Rodriguez, seconded by Commissioner McCormick. So that's all. Those in favor? Aye. 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 That passes unanimously. And now on to the report of the executive director. Yep, so we'll start off with a quick update on the um, village place and the development updates. Um, so those places, as you can see here, we're moving a whole bunch of money around, getting ready to go, um, as, as we are with other projects too. But for Village Place, um, currently we're in design concept review. We're going to be submitting for tax credits here in early April. That is the non-competitive round. I just wanted to show you a couple of um, our 
here. Here we go. Sorry. So we have some, we've done um, some floor plans, some sample floor plans for the common areas and for the units aren't really getting a restructure unnecessarily, just upgrades. But we um, have been having community meetings to present the options for the common area floor plans with the residents. Um, and getting their feedback and finding out what, how they would use their spaces. And so um, if you're familiar with Village Place, here is our atrium and we're planning kind of a, it looks like um, it's almost a balcony with a little coffee bistro and we're going to be changing up our ADA access with the ramp. And really this is the most significant change proposed at the property. Um, our new seating area with the fireplace and reconfiguring the whole office area. So this is where we're at right now with making these decisions and running them by the residents and by property management to make sure we're planning for the future on everything. Um, I just wanted to share some of our inspiration photos for what we want to do on the outside to try and tie um, the property into downtown. Because as we know, there is a lot of brick, but it is pink from 1990. Um, so these are just some ways we could do a brick stain and just some relatively minor updates to just try and make it look like a classic um, downtown building. So we really are trying to think um, about the community as a whole. Um, the plan is to change the name from Village Place to the Village, I'm sorry, Village on Main. Um, trying again to rebrand, um, make it fresh, make it feel classic and um, related to downtown and really help the, the residents take ownership of the new improvements. So some things you're, you're likely to hear from them, so we have to remove some of the trees in the atrium because of potential damage to the foundation. Mm -hmm. It's likely that they will not like that, but that's a structural issue. In terms of the landscaping, obviously looking at it from a septed perspective, but looking at more resilient, sustainable plantings versus what they have to, because uh, they're looking at the landscaping around it. And then we've got to figure out that gazebo uh, because it's, it's an attractive nuisance. Um, it needs to be maintained and it may make more sense that we have to look at it. That's a conversation with LBBA. That's a conversation with LBBA. Yeah. So that's a source of a lot of our problems, especially for the tenants there. So that's going to, I think the DBA is fine with this thing. But we need to figure that out. <laughs> no, the white gazebo on the parking lot. Where oh, Santa sits. Oh, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> well, they moved Santa over here. Yeah, Santa's there. Sat. It's just, it's a, it's a problem there. Right okay. It's just out of sight, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, my question there is, what is the turnover of that you know, at the village place? It's very okay. um, we're we're going to start holding out units vacancies as people vacate. Um, from well, we're deciding when that cut of time cut off is exactly to maximize our financial <laughs> situation as well. <laughs> Um, caveat yeah, with that, um, but having some vacancies available during construction is going to be really advantageous for some residents that would go to a hotel very easily. So, so we know we need it's eight, a balancing act. We know we need eight vacancies. We also know this is financially the one property that's probably strapped the most. When we talked about project based vouchers, we were putting people in the wrong eight line, which was creating a, an income drain into the property. So. We're going to have to really um, work to model what's the right time to start getting the vacancy so that we don't create a more significant financial issue uh, on the property until we get into the presentation. So for our, our general status in the timeline, um, our architectural design is fully underway. We have a general contractor hired. It's going to be Pinkford who did the spoke, so they have a lot of affinities in the area already. Um, and they have family members in there. They just know the site really well, so we're, their, their rapport with the residents is already established. Um, we have exited we've that the, the original tax credit investor from the last 15 year period has exited. So we officially, we being primarily LHDC, owns the property. Um, you're gonna be seeing next Tuesday more money moving uh, because the interest transfer is coming for 
a LHA board consideration after the city council meeting on the 21st um, so that we can demonstrate site control um, and restructure the, the partnerships in preparation for tax credit submittal. Um, the PA, the private activity bonds are coming to city council and then LHA board for consideration also next Tuesday. Um, all of this is lining up for that April submittal. Um, we have a relocation team that we are, we have a, some quotes out for a relocation team right now to start getting them on board early, start that resident engagement process with us, help plan with the design. Um, we have a new investor identified. It's the same one that we worked with on Aspen Meadows Senior, so there's, we've got a relationship there, and we're researching banks. Um, it's a really challenging environment, um, so that's, that's um, in, large, we don't want to in the works. <laughs> so that's, couple, yeah. that's how Village Place is going, currently. And plenty of resident meetings, and those are really going pretty, pretty quite well. RBC, RBC was RBC. RBC. So that's Village Place. Any questions or comments? Commissioners? On Zinnia, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Uh, for Zinnia, we are on track for closing of the financing and start of construction immediately after in that May, early May. Um, a lot of money moving around right now. Um, we, you'll see, you've already pre approved entering into the special limited partnership, but we'll have those partnership agreements coming forward for signature soon. We're doing the final gap arrangements. Um, one is here, another one is coming from LHDC. We're sorting all of that out. Um, it's just going to be a really big push from here till May. Closing is always pretty um, crazy, but we're really prepared. Um, they're in their final re review of DRC right now, so they're they're pushing for building permits as soon as they can. And then we are preparing with all of our partners, including Boulder Shelter, uh, Mental Health Partners, um, for lease up and property management arrangements, making sure that we have staff ready, and uh, there's going to be a lot of work to get this property leased up. So, talking about security and all of these affinities, the security cameras and the security staff, and how are we going to work it all once, once it's loose? So, that's where we are. So, here you have those best protectors here. Okay. Sarah's going to talk quickly about her. Oh, she is. <laughs> that was a great second. Um, so, we go to update on operations. In all of this, the one thing that um, you all need to know about. And and we have to, to dig into it. So you all know Prop 123, one, Prop 123 pass mm -hmm. on the, the taxes for affordable and attainable housing, I think by November? I think it's September. Or by September, we have to declare our intent to, to do this. Mm -hmm. um, it is exceptionally complicated. Uh, some cities are saying they can't do it now because in order to utilize the funds, you have to show that you're going to grow your housing stock by 3% annually. What we don't know is that 3% annually on new builds, or is it 3% on your total housing stock? And so we've got to start digging into that pretty quick. At the same time, we've got to start bottling, I think it, it may be in the summertime, where we have to declare the baseline for our units. Mm -hmm which may be good for us because if we can do that before we start constructing Zinnia, so then we can start modeling in Zinnia being added and then um, Culver being added and then the other affordable housing, um, affordable, attainable home ownership project that we're working on. So on top of all of this, we've got to figure that out in, in about six months to understand whether we can do this or not. There's a lot of angst on this right now in communities mm -hmm. uh, because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Any questions on that? Who's going to use the question about 3% important? The states. There's a meeting tomorrow, I think, mm -hmm. that they're going to try to get some of that drawn out for the state. Yeah. Well, if we we're one of the most aggressive at building, wouldn't that? I mean, nullify the vast majority of municipalities in the state from qualifying. If we don't qualify, then who's qualifying? That's that's the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't even get into the six month review process. Yeah, the fast track for yeah. But you've seen it's also, you know, as long as uh, that 
for forever, right? I mean, well, it depends how it's calculated. Mm -hmm. That's that's where the work's going to come in. Is understanding the playing field and then adapting to it. So, hmm. well, you can prove that which was last season. Um, you can prove to uh, to council to support support the development. Um, what was the back of the envelope calculation that you did to justify it? Or did we just say, well, it's better than nothing, why not? I don't think that any of these details were included were fleshed time. out. Okay. And so it's kind of like what we get into a lot of times. There are already folks talking about pushing legislative adjustments to this. So it's potential legislative adjustments and other things moving forward. Um, I think we probably stand one of the better chances if we can understand how the math is calculated. Um, along those lines, I was going to do a, another meeting, but then we needed to get in here. Another thing I want to update you on, it was a project that started uh, in your role as um, Housing Authority Commissioners. The project shifted over to Fully City Project, which is the project on the affordable attainable home ownership piece. We applied for $3 million, $3.1 million for the state. Uh, Katie and Molly and team did a phenomenal job of putting this together. Uh, we were told yesterday or the day before yesterday uh, that we were awarded $1.87 million for that project. This project yes. Yeah. And so uh, good news for us is that we were awarded that money. Challenging news is infrastructure is going up. Some of these cover the increase that we're seeing. But um, uh, we did really well. Just wanted to kind of let you know what they said. They said after we reviewed your submitted qualifying land use strategies, uh, they would uh, like to not only confirm that you qualify for the funding, but applaud your progress in this area. Um, our project was reviewed based on a variety of factors, readiness, capacity, impact on local housing needs, sustained and equitable community support, provision of community benefits, and sustainable development patterns. And so um, we were the largest ask in this. And then Katie, were we the largest award? I didn't confirm that. Um, I would assume so, because I think our ask was pretty heavy compared to the others. So I would assume so, but I don't I have Congratulations. Good one. That's, that was huge. And I liked your response, Carol. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so we know on that, um, this, on that one, just because it is kind of both, out of both sides of the house. Um, preliminary engineering is coming in. They're working those numbers pretty hard this week, and then hopefully we'll have it next week, and then we'll start digging into the next layer of financials. Um, we may have to do something similar to what we did on the Holbrook project and break it up into segments and so that we can manage that financially. Um, Really quick, let's start with the um, public health security updates, and then we'll go. Lisa has just a couple of things to cover on our projects. Sarah? Sure. So, update on our meth detectors. Uh, basically, I believe Dan, our that basically we're working with in New Zealand, he's shipping the detector out for us to test. He, he had to wait for a SIM card, so there's been some IT glitches that I mentioned last time. So we should have that in our hands soon, um, working with the folks uh, with Ron Valdez, and he works a lot with our Next Light team on our LTE stuff. He's very familiar, so he'll be helping us test those in the communities and see network connectivity and all that good stuff. Um, cameras, basically, we're still in, you know, we're still rolling with that, trying to determine what's best, determine how many we need, etc. And now it's just getting the final bids and which direction we're going to go on that piece. Um, coffee and conversations that have been inserted into all of those and the last one we had was I think a great opportunity to hear some community issues, the last ones at the suites, um, being able to address things at, um, at the level that, that they need is I think you can't just ask a, a patrol officer to come in and understand their, their needs and then and then go out and fix those, right? So we determined some uh, issues with some 
with our neighboring uh, Subaru dealership. So we are going to work with them, hopefully on um, not being so aggressive at driving and hitting people. So um, that would be good. Yes. Do we have a, a hit? No, we do not, but very close. Very literally, close, very I mean, close what's close. good about having Sarah there with us is literally somebody came in and said, someone almost got hit uh, during the meeting. They were walking in, so it's like, well, no, Sarah's here. We can talk. Sarah's communicating with Tim. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's a, big, that's a big help. Also in that meeting, we had a long-standing issue that in the middle of the meeting while she was dealing with this, yeah, there was a um, somebody that had been trying to deal with that numerous warrants that happened to come in right when we had Sarah and Dave Kennedy there, which was also fortuitous timing because they were able to deal with the issue. And, and the point of on that is the impact that you have to the people that live there and seeing how quickly that can occur mm -hmm. when they're there. Um, I think they really, that was the first time they realized, yeah, they, they are trying to deal with these issues. And it was interesting as they were, everybody was going to Sarah saying, thank you. And um, I didn't know what happened. I just know I was talking and all of a sudden I started seeing people moving and, and talking. But it was, and, and they didn't know what happened then until after it was over. So kudos to Sarah and the public safety team. But that's the level this relationship is really operating at. Word is they went from officers friendly to officers in action. <laughs> I, I literally was in the middle of the conversation. We're like, oh, here's so and so. We need to go. And it works. It worked out perfectly. Wow. Um, yeah, it worked out perfectly. And what's the story with some yeah. Subaru? Is it like customers so, coming off? The no, lot? it's a, the folks that work there. Um, <laughs> they're test like they're literally starting to test their cars right when they get out of the private drive. Um, just reckless driving so and a lot of the residents are I mean we heard from more than one so we're going to deal with that I'm actually planning to talk to Tim tonight we'll update Harold on that piece and just having a conversation with management there so. our point is to make them aware of the issue because once you make them aware of the issue uh -huh. then their liability profile starts changing a little bit and so mm -hmm. um, yeah Sarah's also, you want to talk briefly about what you're doing on the safety discussions with Lisa? Sure. Lisa can talk to you sure. Um, so, well, I don't want to steal your thunder, but you you walked to the proper, properties with fire and found some issues, and so that came up today in conversation with the advisory committee. <coughs> what we can do with AMN, senior, um, you know, what we can do with Spring Creek, and I think we've we've figured out um, some good good plan moving forward. Um, and it's also going to be a cost thing as well. So that's where we throw our ideas to Kendra, and she either says no, yes or no, and then and then we, we go back to the drawing board. Um, but the plan is is that Lisa's walking these properties right now, looking, and, and I'll let you talk about that. But at the end of this, we're we're going to meet up and really focus on each community and what. How we need to communicate number one you know porting issues the load bearing issues of, of these units um, and each community will be different right so i'll let you take the show on what you're what you're doing with that so my goal this year was to walk 20 percent of the units i have increased that to 50 percent or more um, i've walked almost all of spring creek by tomorrow i've walked every unit at spring creek i've walked 80 percent of fall river and it is insightful, um, very, a lot of learning, not just for me, for my team, for maintenance, just the different demographics, even in each, each floor, each unit style, um, but seeing some stuff that we need to address as a team. Um, you know, like I said, work with Sarah, taking pictures so we know exactly what we need to go back and address. Yes. Um, when you say walk, um, do you mean, do you, do you, are you entering the unit? Yes, I'm going in every unit. I'm actually in charge of the kitchens. So I check every stove, every fridge, every microwave, every refrigerator. I'm testing all the appliances. Uh, we're doing that as a team. Maintenance is doing the smoke detectors, filters. Managers going into the bathroom, checking everything going on in there. And then my assistant at Spring Creek and Fall River, he's checking all the windows to make sure they're latching properly, that we have egress and 
So it's a big team effort. Yeah. No, I, I was specifically <laughs> asking about securing permission to yes, that so, inspection. Yes, and we're, we're notifying, um, all, we notified everybody at Coffee and Conversations that we were coming in, and then they all got a hand delivered notice to their door. Well, well in advance of 24 hours that we were coming. We're not going down that road. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So, but we're, it's, yeah. the good thing is with having a good team, we're going in and out of these units and getting all this done in less than five to six minutes per unit. Um, we, we have a handful that we do need to go back and re-inspect that they're going to get cure notices, but for the most part, you know, we're getting in and getting out, so. I wanted them quickly to do this because what we were really, I think what the time sink and what we were asking Lisa to do in terms of doing this and the process and then having this connection, it's actually streamlining the process, taking work off of Lisa, Sarah's taking that work, Lisa can focus on other issues that she needs to. And so we're really starting to now get in that, what that flywheel of seeing how this thing works and how quickly we're able to get moved. So I wanted that just based on the budget adjustment. So are the issues that you're finding, are they uh, resident? Yes. Things that they can do or is it management? It's, I'd say 90% resident. Okay. Um, and some of it's just they need to have some help. Um, we're, we've already connected with Walmart Senior Services. We meet with them every other month. So we've let them know that we're entering this. We're going to, um, City HR is actually starting up a volunteer program uh, so Joanne and I are talking that we're going to do some city, um, sorry, property dump days, get dumpsters out for two days that the residents can get the items from the hallway. Volunteers will help get it from the hallway to the dumpster so that we can help alleviate some of that fire load and burden the units. Yeah, we're concerned about fire loading in some of the units and um, having more fuel load in the apartments and the sprinkler systems can actually support. And, and so that's part of what we're looking at. And then, Sarah will partner with Michelle Goldman and then come in and help educate folks about it. Well, make sure you take those dumpsters right back out because you know those residents go right in those dumpsters. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Our plan is 20, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. <laughs> <laughs> And the other goes out cannot come back in. That is the How'd you get this? Stole my stuff. Yeah. So. <laughs> Not only the residents there, the people around. Yeah. But I mean, it may be where you pay them to bring it in, take it out that afternoon, and then you pay them to bring it in. Yeah, we're, we're it doing out. a very limited time frame, so okay. and we will well notice it just to the residents. Okay. So we're on the operations update. So occupancy, um, just briefly, we're still maintaining a 93% occupancy. Now that we're getting out of the, the snow and the freezing weather, we're um, anticipating some more movements. We've had actually quite a few this month. We've also changed how we process our waitlist applicants. So we've turned it all over to the LHA administrative assistant so that she can monitor each waitlist because what we found is when one person applies, they don't apply at just one property, they're applying at all of them. So then they remain on the waitlist for all these other properties and we're calling them saying, hey, do you want this unit? But they're not returning our call for three, five days. And so we're holding this unit thinking, oh, we're going to get a call back when that person's basically stagnant. So one person now is monitoring all nine wait lists. We'll remove somebody if they've rented at one, remove them from all. So that will help us move through our wait list a lot faster. Um, implemented with this, a couple of new procedures where as soon as the manager gets a notice to vacate, they're notifying the admin assistant so that they can start previously that unit 30 days out. So hopefully, it's only down 10 days and that we can get a new hospital day. So we hope to see these occupancy numbers increasing. No new meth unit, so that's a plus. It's <laughs> huge, there you go. And then uh, property updates, all right here. Um, nothing much going on in cold. We are bringing some educational pieces in over the year. Um, I didn't attach that, but we just did a survey at the end of February. Um, the residents were really asking coffee and conversations for educational pieces. So the top ones that we're bringing is um, protecting yourself from scams with Boulder County District Attorney, uh, Be Ready Longmont with the Office of Emergency Management, Fair Housing with Susan Spalding, um, and how to, our maintenance team is going to do how to maintain your apartment, which is going to teach the residents how to turn off the toilet water if it's overflowing. Because it's, oh. it's so simple yeah. how to, um, mm -hmm. Just do different things, um, check stuff, how to work their thermostats, because that's where we see a lot of people struggling. 
So our maintenance guy is going to do, go in with 10 residents at a time and kind of show them how to do some preventative stuff, stuff to help them and how to maintain their apartment in case of an emergency as well. So, I went to Sarah first, so we're good. Oh, okay. Oh, you did it up. Any questions for us? We're all good? Yeah. Do you have any questions for us? Nope. It was on the right word scale. Okay. Nope. Yeah, I comments? I guess we're done. I have a much future. So move. Second. All right.